Welcome to episode 205 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent on a mission to show the public who the FBI is and what the FBI does through my books, my blog, and my podcast case reviews with former colleagues. Today, we get to speak to retired agent Scott Lobb, who served in the FBI for more than 15 years. In this episode, Scott, who worked child sex crimes, juvenile prostitution, and kidnapping cases in the Oklahoma City Division, reviews his efforts to obtain a confession from convicted murderer and kidnapper Franklin Floyd for the murder of six-year-old Michael Hughes. This investigation led to the shocking discovery of the true identity of Michael's mother, Suzanne Savakis, who had been known by many names throughout her lifetime, including Sharon Marshall and Tanya Hughes. Scott Lobb began his federal law enforcement career with the U.S. Border Patrol as a deportation officer with the Immigration and Naturalization Service, INS, and later as an INS special agent. His first bureau assignments were to the Little Rock Division and the Phoenix Field Office, Tucson Resident Agency, where he worked on a Joint Terrorism Task Force, JTTF, and also worked on a drug squad before being transferred to the Oklahoma City Field Office, where he briefly worked drug investigations before moving into the Crimes Against Children coordinator position. In addition to the Michael Hughes kidnapping investigation, Scott Lobb traveled extensively overseas to include Kenya and Peru to investigate U.S. citizens who were engaged in unlawful sexual activity with minors. Later in his bureau career, Scott, a pilot, transferred to the surveillance squad and served as the division's aviation coordinator for the two years prior to his retirement from the FBI. Scott is currently a pilot for the Guardian Aerial Patrol in Oklahoma and flies pipeline patrol throughout Oklahoma and Texas. Scott is writing a book about his experiences working the Michael Hughes investigation. This is an unbelievable case review. Many of you are probably already aware of the true crime story about Sharon Marshall. This episode with Scott will provide a look behind the scenes at how he was able to get Franklin Floyd to finally provide information about her true identity and what happened to little Michael, her son. Before we get to the episode, I want to share some fantastic news. My daughter gave birth to my third grandchild on June 15th, and baby Cooper William Quigley is doing absolutely fantastic. As a matter of fact, I am recording this in Raleigh and just having a wonderful time getting to know Cooper. I'll share a photo of Cooper and the update on my move from South Jersey to Raleigh, North Carolina in my July Reader Team email. Of course, I want to welcome new listeners and invite you to join my Reader Team. This podcast is all about true crime, but if you're also interested in crime fiction, once a month via my monthly email, I keep you up to date on the FBI and books, TV, and movies. When you join my reader team, you get access to my FBI reading resource, which is a colorful list of more than 50 books about the FBI written by the FBI agents who have been guests on this podcast. There is nonfiction, crime fiction, true crime, and memoir. You can join my reader team on my website or use the link in your podcast app's description of this episode. I want to thank you for your support. Now here's the show. I want to welcome my guest, retired agent Scott Lobb. Hey, Scott, how are you? Doing well. How are you? I'm doing great. Now, I write crime fiction, and I don't think I could have or anybody could have come up with a crime story that 
would match this true case. And I don't think anybody would have enjoyed the story because they would have said, this is too far-fetched. This is just too implausible. But everything that happened in this case is true. You know, we talked earlier about how there's so many twists and turns and crises and climaxes. Why don't you just give us a quick introduction before you start? So when I became the Crimes Against Children coordinator late 2012, I got a call actually it was about early 2013, that, and asking me about this case from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. And unbeknownst to me, the prior Crimes Against Children coordinator in Oklahoma City had done a cold case uh, symposium presentation back at uh, Nick Mix headquarters there in Alexandria, Virginia. And they were trying to solve what happened to Michael and or what was the true identity of Michael's mother. And I had no clue what the NICMIC representative was talking about. I said, hey, let me get back to you. Let me, let me d- try to dig this up. So I, I talked to the, uh, the, my um, predecessor and I asked, hey, do you have this symposium presentation that you did? And he said, yeah, and he got it for me and I read it. It was, it was very comprehensive and it gave a, a rundown of history of the case. And at the end of the document that they had produced was a list of 100 or so recommendations to try to track down who Sharon Marshall was and what happened to Michael Anthony Hughes because he had never been seen since the day he was kidnapped out of the Choctaw Indian Meridian or the Indian Meridian Elementary School in Choctaw, Oklahoma. That was on September 12th of 1994. So I also with the symposium was a was a folder with a bunch of notes and, and so forth. And in there was a copy of a book entitled A Beautiful Child, authored by Matt Birkbeck. And I read that book, which provided a really good history of the case. Matt had written the book in the early 2000s about Sharon Marshall and who she was and and the efforts that people had made to try to figure out who she was. It turns out that it was suspected she was kidnapped in the the mid-1970s. What had happened was when The FBI started working the kidnapping case about six weeks after that September 12, 1994 date. And and the reason the FBI got involved is when Floyd had kidnapped the boy, he stole the principal's pickup truck, and that pickup truck was located in Dallas, Texas, six weeks later. And at that point, the FBI got involved because state lines had been crossed. The original case agent who worked the case, Joe Fitzpatrick, in his investigation, determined that Michael's mother had also been kidnapped by Floyd and no one knew who she was. And over the course of her life, Floyd had changed names many times, both his and hers. She was known by at least five different names through her life. And at one point, Floyd married her in New Orleans uh, in about 1988. It was thought that Floyd did this to create the, the spousal, you know, you can't, go against your spouse type defense. And she ended up dying in Oklahoma City in 1990. And it just remained a mystery all this time. Throughout the the, the case, Floyd never talked about what, what he did with Michael. Michael was never seen again. He didn't talk about Sharon. She died in a hit and run accident in Oklahoma City. The only suspect was Franklin Floyd. In fact, the hit and run accident is in question too, because she had blunt force trauma to the back of the head, as opposed to Uh, what you'd expect being hit by a car. She was walking up a uh, frontage road along Interstate 35, coming back from a grocery store. And she had uh, virtually no bruising where the bumper would have hit her at the back of the legs. So there's a lot of questions surrounding her death and who did it. And these were things that just, they never got solved. No one ever knew what happened uh, to both Michael and who Sharon really was. Wow. So there's a lot to break down there. So (laughs) it's it's convoluted. All right. So initially, it sounds like the case for the FBI involves the kidnapping of six-year-old little Michael Hughes. Yes. All right. So where do you want to start? Well, I guess we could start when I got involved in 2013 and kind of how I, how things got ramped up into 2014. So in in 2013, you know, I get the call from the National Center uh, for Missing and Exploited Children, and I talked to my supervisor, and I said, said, look, I know we got other things going on at that time. I was heavily involved in 
FBI's cross-country operation. I was working with the Oklahoma City Vice on juvenile prostitution issues. And I said, give me a couple hours a week to work on this, if that's fine with you. He says he had, he had no problem with that. He just wanted to make sure the other work didn't fall by the wayside. So I kind of I kind of worked at it a little bit uh, here and there. Got the got the very voluminous case file out of uh, closed records there at the office, and commandeered a little office for myself and had all the files in there. And, and a couple hours a week, uh, I'd go in there and start reading old reports and trying to get a feel for the case. I listened to all of Floyd's jail calls. I listened, you know, watched um, videos on YouTube where he had been filmed. I watched some news interviews he did at the time. Uh, I just wanted to get a feel for who Floyd was. I also reached out to the retired agent Joe Fitzpatrick, and we sat down and had a we spoke for a couple hours initially, and he gave me his impression of Floyd and Floyd Floyd was ornery and he goes on rants. He's obstinate and you just have to let him go. If you if you're ever gonna talk to him, you just have to let him get it out of the system. So that's I I spent most of 2013 doing that. Could you give us a a breakdown of what happened at the kidnapping, how he was kidnapped? Yeah. So Franklin Floyd, he had been a federal fugitive for 17 years, and he was caught in 1990 after Sharon Marshall died in Oklahoma City. He had tried to collect on a life insurance policy, and he actually gave his, it's believed he gave his real social security number, and the insurance company somehow got a hit on that and notified authorities. Well, Franklin Floyd realized his mistake and had fled. He was caught shortly thereafter in Augusta, Georgia. He was a federal fugitive from a case back in the 19, I think it's actually the 1960s. He walked away from probation. He basically walked away from probation and disappeared. So Floyd, you know, he gets, he goes to prison. Sharon Marshall's dead. And he, he was fighting for custody of Michael, uh, even from prison. So he fought for visitation rights, was ultimately granted those rights. And he was housed at the Federal Correctional Institute in El Reno, Oklahoma, which is about a half hour um, west of Oklahoma City. So the foster parents had to take him out there from time to time and allow Floyd to have visitation. Well, no one ever thought to ask the court to do a paternity test. And finally, somebody asked for a paternity test, and Floyd fought that. He said, that's my son. I don't need to prove anything. And ultimately, the court ordered it. And lo and behold, the paternity test showed he was not the father. And so those visitation rights were immediately terminated. Well, Floyd finishes out his sentence, is released in about ni- sometime in 1993, and continues to fight for Michael. He's, he's got a lawyer. He's, he's, he's going in front of the Oklahoma legislature and arguing for his parental rights. Anybody who will listen. And he's getting nowhere. And finally, the theory is he just took it upon himself to go kidnap Michael from school. And what he did was he drove out there. He had a firearm, walked into the principal's office, demanded to be taken to Michael's classroom. Principal calls Michael out, gathers things, and the three of them go out to the principal's pickup truck and drive off. Now, Floyd ties up or handcuffs the, the principal to a tree and takes off with Michael. Michael is never to be seen again. Principal is ultimately found and he's freed and the manhunt is on for Franklin Floyd and Michael. And we now know that they went south uh, down I-35 towards Texas. Then in about, when was it? About early 2014, about February, I get a call from Joe Fitzpatrick, the retired agent. And he had done some, some interviews over the years for crime dramas on this case. And there was a, a production in Florida that was going on that was going to highlight this case. And he just wanted to give me a heads up. And I started thinking to myself, well, you know, if Floyd... If he gets wind of this, it might give him, you know, some of the notoriety I think he would crave, and he may be less inclined to talk. So I went to my supervisor and I said, hey, I think it might be time to go out to uh, Florida and interview Floyd, who was on death row. Another twist in the story is he's on death row for killing a topless dancer that was good friends and worked with Sharon Marshall. Now, Floyd throughout his life as we'll get into that, the investigation that Joe Fitzpatrick uncovered, that Floyd had basically made her strip and to earn money. And um, so I went to my supervisor and I said, we need to go. And he, he, he agreed. And I started setting up the trip to Florida, talking to prison officials and what they required from me, getting the permission from Jacksonville field office to come into their territory. 
And one of the smartest things I did in this case is I brought on Nate Furr, an uh, agent I worked with on the squad, who's a, a FBI interview and interrogation instructor. Brought him in in about early March, and he started getting up to speed on Franklin Floyd and what we were dealing with. So we had, throughout the course of those couple months that we were working this together, we wanted three questions answered. One was, what was the true identity of Sharon Marshall? Uh, what happened to Michael? And were you involved in the murder of Sharon Marshall? And I went in that order because I thought, I kind of, I kind of ranked them is what I did. Well, the least, the least intrusive one to him would be, who is she? I mean, that, that's an easy question to answer for somebody, if they're willing to talk. But when you start getting up into the, you know, the killing of people, that's going to be a little harder for him to talk about. But I wanted, to, I wanted to use that one that I perceived to be the easier question for him to answer. And we came up with a, with a strategy, and, and we, we, we kind of struggled with the approach to Floyd. In the interview process, the, the preparation is the number one item. And I'd spent a better part of a year preparing for this interview. And Nate had a couple months to prepare for it. But we still struggled with what, what is our approach going to be? Uh, we knew Floyd was ornery. We knew he was just obstinate, mean. I, I listened to all the jail calls. And what, one thing I noticed in the jail calls was when he's talking to people that, well, I, I guess they're his friends, he's very controlling, even from jail. And, you know, I, I learned from the file and learned from Joe Fitzpatrick that he was a very controlling person. But I also noticed in some of the video I found of him on the internet that he had a deference towards people he perceived to be an authority. Nate and I talked about it, and we ultimately decided that we were going to present me as being in charge of this case, no one else. I called the shots. I I pulled the purse strings. None of it true, but just to give Floyd that perception that he was dealing with somebody in authority. And to that end, uh, you know, I would I would always be dressed a little bit nicer than Nate, and Nate was basically going to be there to take notes and observe behavior. That changed a little bit as time went on. The other thing in the approach was, well, what do we tell him? And I, I, I finally decided that this is what I'm going to tell him. I'm going to tell him, I want to tell your story. Throughout his whole life, people had told his story, whether it be the author of the book, Joe Fitzpatrick, the prosecutors who prosecuted him for the kidnapping. I wanted him to tell, tell me his story, and I'm going to just write down what you tell me. We hopped on a flight in May of 2014, and we flew into Gainesville, Florida on a Monday. And on Tuesday morning, we drove to the prison. We, we were introduced to Franklin Floyd. Did he know that you were coming? Has, was that something you had set up beforehand? No, he did not know we were coming. And I did know from the prison that he had not had a visitor since 2006. So I thought, okay, he hasn't had a visitor at that point eight years he may just be willing to sit down and talk with us, if anything, just to have some human interaction. Because on death row, they are, they are confined to their cells for 23 hours a day. They get one hour for rec time. Uh, but the, one of the captains told us that he never goes out for rec time. He's afraid of the other inmates, but they're not in contact with each other. So Floyd would basically sit in his cell for 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Is he on death row? He is on death row. Okay. Uh, he was, and I'll have to circle back here a little bit, after the kidnapping of Michael, Throughout the course of the investigation, it was determined that, let me back up even further. So when he took the principal's truck, he had taped an envelope, a manila envelope full of photographs on top of the gas tank, and he'd forgotten to grab them. He parked the truck in Dallas at a Wonder Bread factory near Love Field, and he walked away from the truck and we think took a bus to, to Georgia. So the insurance company sold the truck at auction and uh, a mechanic in Kansas bought the truck and he had it up on a rack. He was doing an inspection. He saw the envelope, opened it up and found pictures of which, what turned out to be Sharon Marshall and a uh, topless dancer named Cheryl Camesso. The pictures of Sharon were from her early teenage years and she was in various states of undress and she was naked in some of them. At this time, the unidentified uh, girl that we, no one knew who she was was bound and had various state and various photographs looked to have worsening injuries to her face, fat lip, black eye, things of that nature. In fact, one photo, we, people, uh, some of the early investigators actually thought she was already dead. So Joe Fitzpatrick had no idea who this girl was. 
Well, it turns out in Florida back in 19, 1988, a construct a road crew construction guy went into uh, off Florida's I-275 in Tampa, went into some bushes on, a, on an on-ramp to relieve himself. So he, after he, you know, he's, he's turning around after he's relieved himself and he sees a skull. He thought it actually was a soccer ball and he kicked it and it was a skull. So the cops are called. Uh, this was in the early 1990s. And th- they do a body dig. Uh, the, the, the forensic people come out and they find most of the bones and some clothing. It had been actually been preserved because it was underneath a bunch of mud and, and, and stuff like that. No one connected the two. There's no reason no one would have ever connected these two cases. Well, Joe Fitzpatrick, over time, it just bothered him that he had photographs of this woman. He had no idea who she was. Ultimately, Joe Fitzpatrick notices the, you know, he, he, he surmises, well, she's pretty tan, appears to be wearing a bikini top, and sends, this is in 90s, I think 97, sends some of these photographs around the country to various FBI field offices, including uh, in Florida. And the Tampa guys meet with the St. Pete Police Department, and lo and behold, the, the clothing matches the, the bikini top, and, and they, they make the connection. It matches the clothing that was nearby the skull? Yes. Wow. Yes. They ultimately determined that this is Cheryl Camesso. Her, 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 she's been missing since 1988. Representatives from St. Petersburg Police Department actually fly to Oklahoma City to interview Floyd. And basically get nowhere with him because Floyd is just ornery and he's not going to talk to these guys. So after the kidnapping, Floyd, the the truck, the principal's truck is found in Dallas. And Floyd, uh, we now know, went to Atlanta. And then from Atlanta, he went to uh, Louisville, Kentucky. And Joe Fitzpatrick had the, the brilliant move on his part to send out to all Department of Motor Vehicles around the country the names of the aliases that Franklin Floyd had used throughout his life and be on the lookout for somebody requesting a driver's license in this name. Well, lo and behold, Florida gets back to Joe and says, we just got a request under the name of Warren Marshall, which is one of Floyd's known aliases. He requested a replacement driver's license and that'd be shipped to Kentucky. So the FBI gets the FedEx truck and dresses up one of the agents as a FedEx driver Floyd is working at a used car lot in Louisville. They drive up. Floyd comes out because he knows it's his package, and they arrest him. He, he's found out for who he is. He they arrest him. This is about six weeks after the kidnapping, and of course, no he, he, Michael's nowhere to be found. He won't talk about where Michael is. Just says he's safe. He, he has some nonsensical stories he's told over the years about what happened to Michael and how he how he's safe. And he, he's arrested late ninety four. And then the, the photographs, you know, we've, they finally figure out that this is the girl who's been missing since 1988. Uh, this happens in about 1997. And Floyd is ultimately, uh, a grand jury's convened. He's indicted in Florida for the murder of Cheryl Camesso. And he stands trial. He's convicted, sentenced to death. When were the photos found in the truck? So the photos on the truck were found, oh, I'm not exactly sure uh, the exact time, but it was the truck was found six weeks later in Dallas, and then is shortly thereafter. Uh, after, so probably in October, maybe early November of '94. So before he is actually found and arrested, they have these photos and know that he has done something to this woman. Yes. Yes. Okay. But they don't know who she is. They don't know who she is. So I guess at that time he's only charged and tried for the kidnapping and not for the uh, murder because at this time the victim is unknown and there is no body right you know things things go that way for a while joe ultimately retires from the fbi in the early two it was late 90s early 2000s and this case uh it sat dormant for years until uh, until my predecessor got involved with the symposium in 2012, and then I picked it up in 2013. From there, Nate and I, you know, we get to Florida. We're, we're we're meeting we're meeting Franklin Floyd for the first time. I didn't think much of him honestly when I first saw him. He, he's somewhat frail now. He's in his 70s, and but he's his mind is still sharp. Just like Joe Fitzpatrick said, he would he started right off on a rant, 
we hadn't even introduced ourselves at this point. He thought we were attorneys and he had a two inch thick stack of papers pertaining to his appeal of the murder conviction. And he went on a 45 minute rant about how he was ramrodded, how his life is unfair, how he didn't do any of these things he's on, on in jail for that he was going to win on appeal. And we let him go. We just let him get it out of the system. Finally, I saw, I saw an opportunity and I identified myself and he kind of took that in and then went on a rant about the FBI and how the FBI had screwed him over on the Michael Hughes case and how Joe Fitzpatrick had planted evidence. And we had let him go again for about another half hour. So it went for that first morning. It was just one of these back and forth. And, and finally, now understand for, for the prison, we couldn't start our day there until 8.30 due to breakfast in the morning head count. And then by 11, we had to wrap up the morning session because of lunch and the afternoon head count. And we'd, so we'd go from 8.30 to 11, and then we could come back and do one to four. So we had two sessions a day that were, we were able to do with him. And that first morning was, uh, I wouldn't say it was a waste of time. It was more of getting to know each other. And towards the end of that morning, I told Floyd, I said, listen, I want to tell your story. Of course, I don't believe any of these things I said, but I said, you, you, it does appear you have been screwed over by the FBI, the, by the prosecutors. They, they, you didn't, they made up the story for you and they told a story that apparently wasn't true. Let me tell your story. You tell me and I will simply write down what you tell me. And he thought about it. He, he looked and he, he was quiet and he, he agreed to talk at that point. So we got the buy in. He was interested. I wouldn't say he was willing and able, but he was interested. And I think he would more, more so he wanted to hear what we had to say also and try to gather intelligence as he could on what we were, what we were getting at. But, you know, we made, he, he finally asked, what, why do you want to know all this? And I told him, I said, well, I've reopened the Michael Hughes kidnapping investigation. And he said, well, I'd appreciate it if you'd close it. And I had to explain to him I wasn't going to do that. Uh, but I want to talk about Michael's mom. And, you know, we got nowhere that morning, really. And by then it was 11 o'clock. So we, Nate and I went to lunch. And what I'd, what I'd asked Nate to do was, one, observe Floyd's behavior. You got to understand, we staged this room, too. We, we were in a, a pretty standard interview room that you'd see at any jail or prison. Three, you know, three walls, a cinder block painted a, a cream color. And, you know, of course, a door and a plate glass window so the, so the guards can see in if they need to. And we'd move the table up against a wall and Nate's sitting at the end of the table at the back of the room. And I'm sitting knee to knee with Floyd. And is there a particular reason that you decided to do that as opposed to across the table from him? Yeah. I, you know, you don't, you never want a, a barrier in front of somebody you're talking to if it can be helped. And, you know, that's, you know, something that was ingrained, you know, I think in every FBI agent in the interview interrogation class at the Academy and it's better to sit there. I like to sit, and, and in these cases where it's a little more contentious, or I think it's going to be contentious, I like to sit knee to knee. That way, I have those proxemics to that person. So if he's leaning back and trying in some way, shape, or form to get away from me, I can lean forward and keep that, keep that space pretty consistent throughout the interview. If he's, if he's open to talk and he's, he's rambling and he's just rocking and rolling and talking, I'll sit back and I'll be relaxed just like he is. And when he gets angry or gets uh, obstinate, I like to lean in and, and really ask some pointed questions. Now, the, one of the downsides to that is I, I'm so focused on Floyd and what he's saying, and I'm so close to him, that it was good to have Nate sitting back there taking notes and observing some of his behavior and some of his movements, because I, I, I might have missed some stuff. So Nate's back there taking detailed notes on, on answers to questions and also noting Floyd's behavior which we would debrief after each session. So the, we get back for the afternoon session and we, we start in with, I've always liked to use a timeline. And I decided that, you know, in talking with Nate, that it was not a good idea to start in the 1970s where we think the time frame we think Floyd kidnapped Sharon. So I started back in the 1960s and we got to one point where Floyd was arrested in Georgia back in the early 60s for violent molestation of a child, and that set him off. He 
talked again. He went on a rant again about how he'd been ramrodded and wronged and his life was, you know, woe is me, basically. So we, we get through that. We get through him going on the lam in, in, in about 1973. And he, he starts telling a story about how he ended up in, in uh, Florida working for an old Jewish woman who owned a hotel and he was doing handyman work for her. In addition, he was also working, he said, at a John Deere plant in Hialeah, Florida. He said from there, he said he got scared. He thought the cops were on to him because there was a guy he served prison time with in Ohio back in the 60s, attempted to steal, or they did steal a prison fire truck and attempted to bust through the gates to, to escape from prison in Ohio. And in about 1973, Floyd sees a news report where this guy, his accomplice in that prison break, was in Jacksonville, got into a shootout with Jacksonville police, and was shot and killed. So Floyd surmised that the cops were on to him, so he takes off. Leaves Florida. He goes, he says, to the Bronx, New York. And he knew a guy there from his prison days. The guy wasn't home. He slipped a note under the door. And at this point, I put my hand up, up, up in Floyd's face, said, That's, that never happened. Uh, where did you go? You know, let's, let's go get on with Florida and let's start over again. It kept, you know, with Floyd, you have to keep coming back. He, he likes to jump large periods of time. So you have to keep bringing him back. So I brought him back to Florida and said, what, where'd you go next? The prison break with the fire truck, was it successful? Did they escape? No, they did not escape. The truck uh, was unable, unable to breach through the, the gates. Floyd and this guy had ultimately, ultimately been released from prison. They'd served their sentences. And his accomplice somehow ended up in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, we don't know a lot about him. I don't even know if the, the, sh the shootout story is true. That's just what Floyd gave as his reason for leaving Florida. And uh, Floyd then says he ends up in Charlotte, North Carolina. And he's sitting in a truck stop. He's working for, he got a job as a trainee with the, I don't know if it's the Charlotte or the Charlotte Mecklenburg County Transit Authority driving a bus. And Floyd was, he, he was bragging about how he was the only guy in his class that could operate the air brakes. And he was sitting in his truck stop in his uniform. He, you know, talk about how good he looked in uniform. And I, was, and I was about to put my hand up to stop him again. And something stopped me from doing that. And what Floyd did next, he, he kind of closed, he not kind of, he closed his eyes. And he, he starts telling a story about this woman who he met and who wanted to meet him. And he's, he's what he's doing is he's recalling facts. He's reliving this, this scene in this truck stop. And he's, he's talking about how he met this girl. And he's, you know, at one point I, I, I was going to stop him. I thought he was going down a, a rabbit hole with me again. But something stopped me. And at about that time, Floyd closed his eyes and he starts telling the story about sitting in his truck stop, meeting this girl who wanted to meet him and how good he looked in uniform. He, you know, he ultimately opens his eyes. He's looking at me and he, with a very conversational tone is telling me that he dated this woman for two weeks. She had three children. They ended up getting married. It was, you know, kind of a whirlwind courtship. And I looked at Floyd and I said, well, what name were you using? And he says, why, well, Brandon Cleo Williams. And it's a name that's not in the case file. No one has ever heard this name before. And I said, okay, what was her name? And he says, well, Sandra Brandenburg. Okay, and you guys got married in, in Mecklenburg County, Charlotte area? And he says, yeah. Okay, so we'll probably be able to verify that. And I said, what, what, were, the name of the, what were the names of the children? And he says, well, the, the oldest was Suzanne, and she had uh, two other. The other ones were Allison and Amy. I said, well, tell me more about Suzanne. And he knew where we were going with this. He, he's a, he, made, he made some type of comment. Well, this is the girl you've been, you've been asking about. Okay, well, tell me about her. Well, she was born September 6th, 1969 in Livonia, Michigan. I said, well, how do you know this? And he says, I've seen the birth certificate. Okay. Another piece of information we should be able to verify. And this is towards the end of the, the afternoon session where he, where he tells us all this. And 
we basically end, we, we, we part ways with Floyd. We said, do you mind if we come back tomorrow and talk to you? He says, no, not at all. And, and off he went. The guards took him off back to his cell. Well, it turns out Nate has a contact in Charlotte, North Carolina, and one in Detroit, Michigan, uh, that he's made through teaching these interview classes around the country. And we call Charlotte, he calls Charlotte, and lo and behold, a Brandon Cleo Williams married a Sandra Brandenburg in uh, 1974 in, in the Charlotte area. And we call, Nate calls Detroit and talks to his buddy who puts us in contact with Michigan State Police Trooper Sarah Krebs, who works crimes against children there. And she says, I'll, it, it'll have to be tomorrow. You know, the, the courthouse is, you know, the, the records department's already closed. But let me get back to you. Fast forward a little bit. She gets back to us the next day and she, can, she says, I found the birth certificate and he was absolutely right. And these are the names of the parents. The father is Clifford Savakis and the mom is Sandra, Sandra Chipman. At the time, that was, her, that was her maiden name. And so we're pretty certain at this point we have confirmation of who this girl is pending uh, DNA analysis. And so I called the, I called the Oklahoma City office and, and spoke to uh, Melissa, Sh Melissa Shaver, our uh, staff operations specialist, who, who is just the best in the business when it comes to these research. And she found, she found Clifford Savakis, the father, and Sandra Brandenburg, and now Sandra Willett, in Newport News, Virginia, and they're both still alive. We'll, we'll get to that, but, the, you know, because Nate and I do, we do go visit them uh, about a month later. Well, we go to the prison the next day. And we're I, you know, back up a little bit. Nate and I are we're ecstatic. I mean, we, we, Floyd told us who she was. We, we had verifiable information to see if he was telling the truth. Turns out he was. And uh, we go back the next day with, with some confidence. Well, that confidence was short lived because Floyd was not, we had, we had uh, Wednesday and Thursday left to talk with him. And Floyd was not going to talk to us about Michael Hughes at all. He made a lot of statements that pointed towards Michael being dead, pointed towards his guilt, but he just was not going to give it up. We were trying to get a confession about what happened to Michael. We, we were 100% certain Michael was dead. We just didn't know how and where and when it happened. So, Were you still feeling a little bit optimistic because you were answering questions about who Sharon was. Yes, yes, we were. We were absolutely feeling optimistic because of that. But the next, the, the next few interview sessions, you know, Floyd leaked a lot of information. And when I, he made one very interesting comment to me that made me sit back and just stare at him. He, he at one point told me, I have been in for 20 years for something I didn't do and something I did do. And I should be free because of the law, not Michael. And I sat back and I contemplated that. I said, I should be, and I played it over my head. I should be free because of the law, not Michael. And I looked at Floyd and I said, are you telling me you never took Michael out of the state of Oklahoma? And he, he looked at me with this a quizzical look. And I said, hear me out, Floyd. I said, just hear me out on this. If you didn't take him out of the state of Oklahoma, you can't be you can't be charged for federal kidnapping. You got to cross state lines. You know this. And then you're going to win your appeal on the, on the Cheryl Comesso murder. You're going to walk away a free man. Let's talk about what happened to Michael. And he, he, he kind of realized he, he dug himself a little bit of a hole in, in, into a hole and maybe it said too much. And he clammed up. He wouldn't talk. He wouldn't, he wouldn't go any further. He just went on to rants about how he was wronged. That was his, that was his default position. Um, always to rant about how everybody in his life had had screwed him over. He would say things like, you know, I, I, I haven't talked to Michael. Uh, I, I couldn't talk to Michael. I gave him away to friends who whisked him away to South America. And, and another story, he tells us that he's married to an attorney and they live in Kansas, but I can't tell you where because she's a government attorney working top secret stuff. It was just nonsensical stuff. But he leaked this information uh, about what we thought was most likely, you know, he's a, essentially admitting to Michael's murder without saying, I killed him. But another thing he said to us that, that turned out later to be a very true statement, he says, 
I asked him, I said, was, was Michael a burden to you? And he says, no, he couldn't be a burden. He wasn't with me, but a day. And I, I asked him, I said, well, does that mean you, what happened to him? Why were you only with him a day? And he knew where I was going with that. I kind of thought m- most likely what happened is that he killed Michael the day he kidnapped him. And he goes on to those nonsensical stories again about, I already told you, I gave, you know, some friends took, I was being chased by the mob was another story. And they, they whisked him away to South America. And, and, so, and so it went for the rest of that trip. That's the short, sh- short version of that first trip. Um, there was a lot more verbal battle that, that went on in that interview room with Floyd. He is a very smart and adept <laughs> liar. Storyteller, liar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, let me ask you, that first trip, did you get any further with him on... Sharon and the fact that you believe that she was one of the one of the children of the woman he had married. Did you get any further with him on that? You know, we 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 really didn't. And when we we tried to press for details, his his fallback position was, "I just told you who she was." You know, and basically, he's telling us to take the victory. And sitting there in the interview room, I decided that, okay, let's move on. Let's move on to Michael. I also want to start talking about Sharon's death also. And when it came to, when it came to Sharon's death, he absolutely would not talk about it in any way, shape or form. Uh, He just, he just cut us off. He said, I'm not talking about that. And I don't know why. Uh, I don't know if it's so painful for him, but I, I don't know why. And of course, that gives you more suspicion because this was supposed to be his wife. And at least he should be interested if there was a hit and run driver finding out, you know, who this driver was and bringing justice for Sharon. But he wasn't even interested in that part of the of the story. You would think as the husband of Sharon that he would at least want to talk to you about this alleged hit and run driver and try to find out who who struck her. But he wasn't even interested in that. He just didn't want to talk about her death at all. No, not at all. Not at all. I I would argue he didn't even care about her. So, uh. Mm. Well, let me ask you another question that I'm sure people are thinking along with me. What was it that made everyone suspicious that he may have kidnapped Sharon? So Sharon is supposed to be his wife. It's the mother of his alleged son, Michael. And, you know, she's she's hit and run and you're not able to identify her by her name. There's you know nothing to prove who she is. Why was there a suspicion that he had kidnapped her as a young child? And where did that come from? So that came from Joe Fitzpatrick. And, and back in the day when they were investigating the Hughes kidnapping after September 94, a gentleman came to the FBI with a photograph of Floyd. And it's one you can find on the internet. It's a picture of Floyd in his younger days with a young girl, long, young blonde headed girl sitting in his lap. And that photo was taken for a church directory here in Oklahoma City. He had approached the FBI. Joe Fitzpatrick had talked to him. Hey, they got the picture. And he, what this guy said was, hey, Floyd came back all these years later, found me, and asked if I still had that picture. He wanted it back. And the guy's like, I don't have that picture anymore. But he found it. He has got curious and started looking through some old, I don't know, shoe boxes or something at his house and found that photograph and brought it to the FBI. And it became apparent to Joe from, from looking at that photograph of that little girl that that was looked a lot like Sharon Marshall. And Joe came to the realization that, you know, my gosh, he kidnapped her too. But no one, you know, years were spent trying to find out the identity of her, of Sharon, the true identity. And there was just nothing to go on, nothing at all. So it, it, it called a, it called a hunch, if you will, for, for the longest time. But he, Joe came to the conclusion that he kidnapped that girl, and we now know that he did. This is unbelievable. Just an (laughs) unbelievable tale. It's, it's, yeah, it's it's very convoluted, isn't it? (laughs) So how long were you down in Florida for this first trip? How many times were you able to, how many days were you able to interview him? So we interviewed him uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. So the May 27th through the 29th, and our, you know, we left on a Friday morning. 
And then we, we get back to Oklahoma City and we started making preparations to go visit mom and dad, birth mom and dad. Sharon's birth mom and dad. Yes, correct. Sharon's birth mom and dad. So we did that at the end of June, we, on June 30th. And we find, you know, at this point now, this will be a little bit confusing, but a lot of people knew her, people who followed this case, you know, knew her as Sharon Marshall. I now call her Suzanne. So if you hear me using Suzanne, and you, it just, it's, think it's interchangeable with Sharon. It's the same person. So we go and visit dad and uh, Clifford Savakis, and he lives in a suburb outside of Detroit. Uh, he's been remarried for, you know, years, 30 years or so. We fly to Detroit and Trooper Sarah Krebs picked us up at the airport and she had already contacted Savakis, Cliff Savakis. He knew she was coming. He had no idea two FBI agents from Oklahoma City were coming. And I still, at this point, Jerry, had no idea how I was going to approach Cliff Savakis and tell this story. I really didn't. What I had done prior to leaving, though, is had our office photographer take that church directory photograph and s- basically separate the two. Floyd and, and Suzanne separated on, you know, that photographer separated on the computer. So then I had two photographs, one of just him from that time period and one of just her, you know, from the 70s also, that same time period. And I asked Clifford Savakis, I said, do you know this man? And I showed him a picture of Floyd, that picture. He says, I have no idea who that is. I showed him the picture of Suzanne. And he looked at that picture kind of hard. And he says, well, it could be my daughter's Suzanne. I said, okay. And I said, I said, well, do you recognize the name? And this is going to, this be another t- twist in the, in the, in the, in the story. I said, are you familiar with the name Tanya Hughes? He says, no, he wasn't. Tanya Hughes was another name that Sharon Marshall had used in her. In fact, that was the name she was, she was killed under. She was known as uh, Tanya Hughes at that time. I said, well, there's a girl named Tanya Hughes. that was, uh, you know, killed in a hit and run accident in Oklahoma City in 1990. She had a boy named Michael Hughes, who was ultimately kidnapped in 1994 and hasn't been seen since. And I weaved this story and I, I walked it back and I said, Tanya Hughes was known as Sharon Marshall at one point in her life during her high school years. And she was a gifted student and, and we're trying to make the connection. We think you might actually have some information relevant to this and you just don't know it. And he's you know, not, nothing's registering with him. I finally tell him, I said, listen, we, we think that Tanya Hughes, or Sharon Marshall, we think she's Suzanne Savakis and that she was the one who was struck and killed in Oklahoma City in 1990. And he's stunned. I just, he's stunned. I mean, what other reaction would he have, right? And I told him what we, the information we got from Floyd. And I said, we would like to collect a cheek swab from you for DNA analysis. And he, he readily consented to that. And Sarah Krebs, the trooper, took, his, took the DNA sample. And we, we sat there with him for quite a while asking questions about Suzanne and her life. And he told us that he came back from Vietnam. She'd been born while he was in Vietnam as a soldier. And she, the mom, Sandra, had already shacked up with another guy and he tried to see her when he could but sandra moved to virginia and he saw her last time he saw her she was about two years old and of course this you know this is early 1970s there's no internet there's no zoom there's no facetime they kind of went their separate ways and he never saw her again so we we thanked him you know for his time and and you know told him we're, you know, we're terribly sorry for your loss. And this is tough news to to stomach. And, you know, here's my number. If you have any questions, you can call me whenever you want. We did tell him we were going to go find, we're going to go to Virginia next and talk to uh, Sandra. And he just kind of nodded his head and and off we went. We fly to Virginia and we find, we find Sandra. She lives in a trailer park in Newport News. So I, we, we find the trailer park, we, we knock on the door, she's home her, with her, one of her daughters, not Allison or Amy, but she's, she, has a, she has quite a few other kids, seven or eight kids, I think. And I'm going to use the same tactics with, with Cliff. I'm going to show, show her the photo of Brandon and then show her the photo of Suzanne. So I said, well, you, we're, we're inv- I had some cover story about why we were there. And I pulled out this photograph and show, and she before I could even get a word out of my mouth, she said, that's Brandon Cleo Williams, and he stole my daughter, Susie. And I was like, whoa, okay. Wow. 
I, you know, chills went up me when you said that, and I can only imagine your reaction. You know, you haven't even asked a question. And Not even a question. What, what was your reaction? What were you thinking to yourself? My, 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 my jaw was open. I was like, uh, I, I, I had to really kind of gather my wits. Okay, um, please, Miss Willett, tell us, what, what do you know? And she goes on to tell us that she married Brandon Cleo Williams. And at this point, I interrupt her. I said, you, do you know what his real name is? She goes, no. I said, well, his, his name is Franklin Delano Floyd. She goes, I've never heard that name. I only knew him as Brandon Cleo Williams. So, okay. I said, uh, well, how'd you guys meet? And she said they met at church, not at a truck stop, but at church. But her story is very similar from that point on in that they dated for like two weeks and got married. But at this point, her kids, the state had custody of her three kids and Floyd had promised to help get them back. And which Floyd had also told us that he helped get these kids back. So those stories, Matt, just the, just the, where they met was a little bit different, but that you know, kind of, a, I didn't put a lot of stock in, you know, I, it wasn't a something I was going to go drill down on they, because everything else pretty much matched. So they get married. She gets the kids back. They move. Floyd said they moved to her parents' house in Reading, Pennsylvania. If I remember right, Sanders said they moved to St. Charles, Missouri, which Floyd also says from Reading, they went to St. Charles, Missouri. So there's some disconnect about Reading, Pennsylvania, which was fine, but they end up in Dallas, Texas. So I said, what'd you do in Dallas? And, and, and she says, well, I've, you know, raising the three girls, we had an apartment. She, she said she wrote a hot check for diapers. And she wrote a hot check, I think it was at a 7-Eleven, for some, something oh, like a dollar and seven cents. But she, anyway, she, she was arrested for writing this hot check. And there was also, we think there was a warrant for her out of North Carolina. We're not really, we never could track that down, but not uncommon 40 years later, right? She gets out after 30 days. This is in uh, September of 75. She's arrested. 30 days later, she gets out. And everybody's gone, and she's she's she freaks out, and she calls a deacon at the church, and they ultimately find Allison and, and Amy at a Baptist children's home in the Dallas area, but Floyd and Suzanne are nowhere to be found, and he she hadn't seen them, she hasn't seen Suzanne since September of 1975. Wow! And how old were all the girls at the time? So Suzanne, at this point, 75, she would have been. She would have just turned six in September of 75, and the other two were five and three. So, Wow. So does she report it? I mean, was, was Suzanne a missing child, you know, registered as a missing child all this time? No. So, what? Yeah. So we, you know, I, I, I started asking her, well, what, what did you do? She goes, well, I went to the Dallas Police Department. And I went to the FBI office in Dallas, and they all told me to leave, and they kicked me out. I said, that doesn't sound right. Are you sure about this? She goes, they all told me that, well, he's the stepfather. He has, he has every right to those kids as you do. You married them and, and be gone. And I, you know, I can't verify any of that. And I, I can't speak for the Dallas PD, but I don't think that would have happened at the FBI office. So we talk about what steps did you make to try to find her? And she really didn't have an answer for us. And I mean, I, I get it. There was no central, you know, this is one of the things Joe Fitzpatrick found out. There was no really central repository for missing kids at that time. Missing kids weren't tracked. They weren't a priority for local police departments. Of course, now we have the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, which sends out alerts constantly. We have Amber Alerts and, and, and things of that nature now. Those weren't in the toolbox 40 years ago. Still, it's just so sad just to think that, you know, someone has taken your child and, you know, even if all those tools weren't in place, I mean, I would go to, you know, I would do everything in my power yes. you know, to get my child back. And I think that's the case for, for every parent. So I'm sorry, but I'm not going to give her any slack on this nor do I. You know, so we, we wrap up interviewing her, trying to get as much background information on her and, and Suzanne as we can get. And 
she consents to a cheek swab. So I take a cheek swab from her and we leave. And as Nate and I are driving back to the hotel, we went out to dinner that night. And I, I told Nate, I said, Nate actually brought it up first. He said, there's something not sitting right with me. I said, there's something not sitting right with me with her story either. And he, he at one point said, man, you should have pressed her harder. And I said, Nate, I agree with you, except I needed something from her. And that was a cheek swab. And if I start going from interview to interrogation, that might shut that down. And we needed that cheek swab. Let's go back tomorrow and talk to her. And we did. We went back. This would have been July 2nd, the, the, the second day we were there. And we went back and talked to her and tried to try to drill down on what her efforts were and tell us more about Floyd and what did you do and why didn't you, why didn't you, you know, press the police to, to look into this matter. And, and it, it went nowhere, Jerry, it just, it just went nowhere with her. She, she just, what, you know, she was giving us the best answer she could. I, I do feel that, but I don't, I don't think she was willing to talk to us about some of the deeper questions we had about what appeared to me to be a lack of concern and a lack of effort to find Suzanne. Well, let me ask you this. Did you, as you did in the case of, uh, of the father, did you let her know what your suspicions were and, and, and what had happened to Suzanne, Sharon, Tanya? Yes. So, and how did she react here? Here, here's, here's my time where I'm going to try not to be judgmental. (laughs) What was her reaction when you told her that? I told her the same story I did with the father. I said, are you familiar with the name Tanya Hughes? And she wasn't. I said, there was a young girl named Tanya Hughes. It was killed in a hit and run accident in 1994. And she had a baby boy named Michael who was kidnapped in 94 or she, she was killed in 90. Michael was kidnapped in 94. And she, the daughter who was there, who was kind of her caretaker, put two and two together right away. She has tears streaming down her face. And I go on about how this girl was known as Sharon Marshall in the 1980s throughout her high school years. And she was a beautiful girl, a gifted student. And she picked up on it then and she starts crying. And that's when I told her, I th- we think that Sharon Marshall is your Susie. Wow. And she was, she was crying. I mean, there's no doubt her reaction was real. It was raw. Of course, there I am standing, giving, giving her basically a death notification all these years later. And even more than that, you know, she's, she's learning that her, you know, young daughter has grown up, you know, in the hands of, of this man who later, you know, claimed that she was his wife, which is a confirmation that she had been, you know, molested and sexually assaulted by him, you know, for most of the time that he was with her. And and that is, I just can't imagine living a life like that. Yeah, yeah, I I don't know how she did it. Um, it uh... And plus, when you said that she was an honor student, I yes. mean, how how resilient? I mean, I I really. I'm so amazed and, you know, I don't even know who Suzanne is, but I'm just so amazed that even in all of that, that horrific upbringing, you know, she still embraced education and that she was an honor student. That you know, Yes. Wow. You know, again, referring back to the, the author of the book, Matt Burtbeck of, of A Beautiful Child, he, he does a great goes into great detail about her life uh, during her high school years and how uh, smart she was, how well liked she was. She, in fact, got a, a scholarship to Georgia Tech in aerospace engineering. She wanted to be in the Air Force. But, you know, F- Floyd ultimately was able to extinguish those flames that she had to, to, to live life. So, And nobody suspected. <clears throat> I know your your part, you know, what we're doing today is talking about the investigation. So I guess I'll have to get the book to really learn, uh, or all of us will have to get the book to, to learn more about her life. But I can't imagine that no one would have suspected that there's something strange here, especially when somebody who is supposed to be his daughter now becomes his wife. Yeah, and there are people along the way who who had some suspicions, but they thought they write it off as well. Franklin Floyd was just a a doting father and a protective father, and they, they just didn't want to get involved. Um, so, 
you, you know, there were some people that had suspicions, but when a lot of times when, when people get those suspicions, Floyd would up and move with and take, you know, Harry and Sharon would, would go. She moved from Georgia to, to Phoenix, to the Phoenix area, and then from Phoenix back to Florida. And she, she lived a very troubled life, but she was, you know, she somehow persevered through that and was able to maintain some social relationships and, and had, had a couple, couple pretty good friends and, and maintained the academics. I don't know how she did it, but she did. And so her mother now is learning a little bit about her life, you know, from you. And it sounds like her reaction was appropriate. It does. Yeah, it does. And I, I told her about the book and I said, listen, you may not want to read that book because you're going to see what your daughter went through. But she did. Uh, I later found out she did read that book. Oh, so the so the book was written before they even were able to confirm her true identity. Yeah. In fact, the book was centered a lot around trying to identify who she was. Wow. Um, and, and when they say beautiful child, were they talking about both Sharon and Michael? No, was, the book was centered around Sharon. Okay. As just as an unknown, I'd love to learn a little bit more about it. So who, the person who wrote the book, was he a reporter or somebody who knew Sharon? Uh, no, he was, uh, he's an investigative reporter by trade, but he has written quite a few books. Um, I've read a few of them. They're actually quite good. He's a, he's a very good author, does a great job on a beautiful child with his investigative reporting and his investigative work. And then he wrote a follow-up book uh, titled Finding Sharon, which details her, the discovery of who she is. So, Okay, so <laughs> it, the third book needs to, to uh, come about. The third book would be the investigation behind that story. So there's only one person who could write that book. So I, I'm kind of working on it, you know, when I can. Okay, good like to know. Tell that, could tell that story someday. All right, so now you've been able to confirm who Sharon is. So yes. what happens next? So we get uh, we get the results back that from the from the DNA samples and there was a still a blood sample for Sharon on file from the accident and I think it was from the accident they still had a blood sample they had the DNA profile the match comes back it's her so we we did call Clifford Savakis we did call Sandy Willett and let them know that the the test was it, it that was Suzanne Savakis from there we Nate and I start planning on going to back to Florida to interview Floyd. We've gotten an answer to one question. We still have two questions we'd like answered, that being what he do with Michael and what was his involvement in Sharon's death. So we were spent that summer working on it, and then we had to push it back because I had a, a case involving a church missionary who was raping orphans at an orphanage in, in outside Nairobi. So I had to travel to Kenya in August and work that. And then uh, we finally got the opportunity to go back to Florida in late September. And one of the things Nate suggested, and I thought it was brilliant, was we had gone to see Floyd for every available session we could, morning and then in the afternoon. He suggested, listen, he's obviously going, Nate, for Nate's point of view, Floyd was going back to his cell after like for the lunch break and he would build up these walls again and then we'd have to come back in the afternoon and try to break through these walls floyd would get an idea of what we were aiming for and then build up a defense and you know nate nate used the term he'd build these walls and we had to break through these walls so we decided on this trip we weren't going to use every every session to meet with floyd so we met with him the first day, late September, you know, because we've got to get that trip in before the end of the fiscal year, right? Or finance, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you remember those days? Yes, I do. <laughs> but uh, so we're out there. It might have been around September 27th. We meet with Floyd. And, of course, he's he's an old ornery self. He pretended to not remember who we were. But once we got through that, he remembered who we, who we were. We told him to want to talk to you about Michael Hughes. You know, he went through some of the same stuff. I res you know, I rescued that kid from abuse. He he'd accused the, the foster parents of abusing him, which is just anything could be further from the truth. The, the the foster parents had, I think, fostered over eighty kids when they were 
you know, when they were fostering kids and they're just wonderful people. I, I mean, I've met them, just wonderful people opening their home like that. And so we spent that first session with Floyd reintroducing ourselves and, and fighting through his denials about Michael being in South America, about Michael being married to a, an attorney, a government attorney in Kansas. And the session ended. That, I believe it was, a more, it was an afternoon session. So we go back down to Gainesville from the, from the prison, and we decided we're not going to go back in the morning. And Floyd's going to be expecting us, but we're not going to go back. So we didn't. We didn't go back until 1 o'clock the next afternoon. And it, it's, Floyd was, he comes into the interview room, and he, I believe he made mention of the fact that we weren't there that morning, and he asked why, if I remember correctly. So Nate's theory worked. It, 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 it tripped him up a little bit. You know, at that point, we, we go back into basically where, where we had left off. Point, I'm getting a little bit frustrated with Floyd. Uh, so we would switch chairs. Nate would take over the lead on the interview. And I would sit back there and observe and take notes. Floyd, at one point, I don't remember who was talking to him, but he, he wanted to bargain. And he asked a question of one of us. He said, what's in it for me? Which was an interesting statement. And at this point, I think it was, that was me who asked that or, you know, got that answer from him. What's in it for me? And I finally feigned frustration. I got up and I walked out of the room. I was gone for about a minute to a minute and a half. And Nate takes over. And, and I guess what had transpired in the room, according to Nate, was he'd asked, what's wrong with him? He said it, you know, a little less delicately, but he said, what's wrong with him? And Nate told me, he, he just wants the truth and, and so forth and so on. I come back in. And I sit down next to Floyd. He says, get away from me. <laughs> so I, I, I actually, okay. I get and walk to the back of the room and lean up against the wall. And Nate, Nate has got him, got him to a point where he's got him a little bit emotional. And Floyd starts making comments. You know, he, he, how he got him emotional was talking about Michael and how you were obviously a good father. Michael was doing well. And, you know, none of the stuff we believe, but, you know, Michael, because of you, was the person that he was and he was making progress. And, and Floyd's, re, you know, obviously remembering this, it starts getting a little bit emotional uh, in the form of some sniveling, you know, I call them crocodile tears. And he finally looked at me and he says, Why do you want to know where a dead person is? Well, that's a huge statement, right? Um, oh, yeah. And he, and then he asked. He goes. He asked um, this after he made the comment to me. Prior to this, he said, "You're wasting your time on a dead son of a bitch." Whoa. And <laughs> I said, "Why would you call the son that you profess to have all this love for an sob?" And I replied with, "Where's Michael?" He said, "Buried." And I said, "Buried, huh?" And he he starts to cry. And I take this time at this moment, I walk back. He, Floyd at this point is looking to his right again, up, uh, uh, in the cinder block wall and he's crying. So I move back and sit down next to Floyd and I start asking him, how'd you kill him? Floyd, how'd you kill him? And he's, he's ignoring me. He's, he's talking to himself. And at one point he uses um, you know, some of Jesus' last words on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And at that point, I slam my hand down on the table my voice a little more raised. How'd you kill him? He looked at me and said, don't you do that? I startled him. And I started asking him over and over again, how'd you kill him? How'd you kill him? Floyd, how did you kill him? And Nate's asking, you know, where, where, where is he? Where's the body? And so forth and so on. And he finally looked at me, waterworks came off. He turned and looked at me and said, I shot him twice in the back of the head to make it real quick. Mm. And with that, we had, you know, a, a confession to to Michael's death. Did he tell you more? He did. So we went on and now keep in mind before this, he had given a, he had, he'd given some false confessions about where, what he had done with Michael, where he had killed Michael. He said it was in the Oklahoma city area, but we didn't believe him. We, we kept, we had to, we had to keep walking him down. What we did was, was Nate got up there and, and prior to this, Nate, one of the things he did was you know, I've got the beginning of your story. I got the end of your story. I need what's in the middle here. I need to know what happened in the middle. And we finally, at one point, got him to, 
he says, I can't remember if it was in Oklahoma or if it was in Texas. I said, so you killed him the day you kidnapped, which we, which he admitted he had. And what was going through your mind? You know, was this kid, he's just out of control and he didn't want to be with you and so forth and so on. And you just lost, you snapped and you killed him. And, and, and that's essentially what happened. He, Floyd knew that he could never have a life with Michael or try to build an imaginary life with Michael like the one he thought he had with Sharon Marshall or Suzanne Savakis, where he would raise this boy into adulthood. It had been about four years since Michael had seen him when he kidnapped him. Is that right? Mm -hmm. That's right. There have been some prison visits uh, for an hour at a time, an hour, hour and a half at a time, but that was it. And once it was discovered that he was not the father through a paternity test, those prison visits stopped. So it had probably been at that point a couple of years since he'd seen him. We asked where it was, and he, he went from Oklahoma, he jumped across the border to Texas, back to Oklahoma, and so forth. And then he finally said, well, I remember the off-ramp. And he, he drew the off-ramp. He, he drew a very specific off-ramp, and you know, the, his actual drawing is actually in the case file. And it involved interstate, what it turned out to be was Interstate 35, the last exit leaving Oklahoma as you're going south into Texas before you cross the Red River, and Highway 77, which goes back to the north, and then the old Highway 77, which dead ends into a uh, wooded area. And that's where it happened, was that dead end, dead end in the wooded area on the old Highway 77, which is no longer used. It's, not, it's, you know, it's just an overgrown road now. That's where he said it happened. And Nate and I spent some more time with him trying to drill down on some more specifics, caliber of the weapon, where did he get the weapon from, what did he do with the body. And Floyd was making some statements such as, I, I, spent, a lot, I spent a couple hours with him. I was, you know, I was still dressed in my suit, and I spent a couple hours with him, and we talked, and we prayed, and, and then I shot him. It's just, he, you know, he, he didn't spend any time with that kid, and there's no way he spent time in Oklahoma in September in a suit with all the humidity, there's, it's just nonsensical. Anybody who's been in Oklahoma at that time here knows it's, it's miserably humid. So our sessions ended. We go out to the car where our phones are because you can't bring phones into the prison. And we start going down I-35 on, on our map program. And lo and behold, he drew out the last exit to a T. I told Nate, I said, something happened at this off ramp. He, to, for him to remember this 20 years later and exactly something big in his life happened here. You know, so we, we decided at that point, we're not coming back. We're not coming back at this point. We're going to come back, but we're going to come back with overhead, overhead photographs and maps and, and, and photographs from the site. That's what we decided to do. So we left. We left Florida. We didn't get back until January. He really didn't come off the, the, the confession story, you know, the confession of, of murdering Michael, but he tried to say it didn't happen there. And he started pointing all over the map and we finally got him back to that off ramp in that wooded area. And we had photographs cause we had gone and visited the site and we had photographs. He didn't really understand the overhead photographs, but he, he looked at the ones that we had taken from the ground. He says, Oh, right outside that suburban door, there's a depression right there. There, there's an area that there's a little pond from, you know, standing water and that's, that's where it happened. And, and, you know, he, he described the area, not just the off ramp, but he, you know, kind of described that area to T as if something, something happened there. So, and this time we got, you know, we got, we got him to write everything down and he, he wrote out a written confession. And 20 years later, we had, uh, we had the truth of what happened to Michael. I just can't imagine what, you and Nate's reaction was at that time because, I mean, like you said, it's 20 years. I mean, you were successful in identifying Sharon, but you just kept pushing and pushing and pushing, trying to figure out what happened to Michael. So what yeah. was that like? So in trying to push for, you know, push him about Michael, it was a lot of the, a lot of the stuff, you know, we're trained for an interview and interrogation was somewhat for me out the window in that, I noticed early on, and one of the things I did was I would say stuff to Floyd, such as something about his lot in life, to make him angry. Because we had discovered early on from even our first visits back in, in, in May of 2014, that when Floyd got angry, he leaked a lot of information. Not outright confessions, but he would make comments like, such as, I wasn't with him but a day. And, or, you know, I, I'm in here for 
I've been in it for 20 years for something I did, something I didn't do, things of that nature. And, and I use that against Floyd and would, would almost some people would probably see some of the stuff I said to him as being a little too personal, but I knew it angered Floyd. And I knew when he was angry, again, he leaked that information, which would give us things we could follow up with on at a later date, which we did. I mean, we used a lot of the stuff he leaked to put together a, a picture of him murdering Michael. And, you know, ultimately with Floyd and Nate guy, Nate spot on this assessment, he just ran out of excuses. He had nowhere else to go. He had no, he had run out of everything he could think to tell us. And, that, and we got him to a point where he was ready to confess and he did, you know, so Nate and I were, I wouldn't say ecstatic about it. We were, we were happy. We'd, we solved it. But you know, at the end of the day, Jerry, there is no, there's no joy in this case. I mean, there's people dead. Who knows what their lives could have been had they not run across Franklin Floyd. Michael was, when he was a baby and, and, and living with, with Floyd and, and Sharon, his mom, he was severely developmentally behind, wasn't eating right. He grunted, he banged his head he, to communicate. And, <clears throat> you know, the, the foster parents had done a wonderful job of rehabilitating him and bringing him back and getting him talking and speaking and reading books. And he was going to school. Who knows what his life could have turned out to be? But Floyd decided, you know, I'm selfish. I'm going to, he snuffed that out. The one disappointment I do have in this is that we never got him to talk about, about Suzanne and what his involvement was in her death. He, for whatever reason, he just will not talk about that. We tried on three different trips to get him to talk about that. I couldn't find a way to, you know, flank his position to, to get him to talk. And he just wouldn't. But you still suspect that he was involved in, in her death? that he might have even been the hit and run driver. Yeah, and I I actually believe she died of blunt force trauma to the head. I'm not so sh I don't buy off on the fact that she was hit by a car. I think somebody came up from behind her and you know like a baseball bat or something like that or pipe something and, and because the blunt force trauma to the back of the head is just not indicative with the well, it could be indicative of a hit and run like where you get thrown on the pavement, but there's no bruising where the car would have hit her. I don't think we'll ever know. And Floyd's not going to talk. This case is actually profiled on the FBI website, and there's a picture of the evidence response team mm -hmm. at the site, you know, looking for, for Michael's body. Could you talk about that? Yeah. So when Floyd had given us that location, and after we got in this, I think that picture was taken in March of 2015. So it had been after we were done interviewing Floyd. I, I approached my supervisor and said, look, he's given us this location. We got to go down there and at least try something. I, and and the, the problem with that part of Oklahoma is, is all the wild pigs that roam down there. And pigs will, I mean, they'll eat even bone. And the, the only thing they can't get in their mouth is a skull. But I, I surmise that if, if two rounds to the, to the back of the head would have done sufficient damage to the skull, that they probably could have gotten, gotten that too since it would have been broken. What we were hoping to find, Jerry, was maybe eyelets from his shoelaces or from his shoes, maybe a belt buckle, uh, you know, snap from his pants or something like that, and maybe even the bullet casings. So we, the evidence response team also brought down a uh, anthropologist from the University of Oklahoma and a investigator, forensic, uh, forensic something or other from the state, and they assisted. And we picked about a 2,000 square foot area and spent two days going down through the soil, about six to eight inches, sifting, sifting all the dirt. And we, we found nothing. But, you know, we, we could have been off by five feet, Jerry. You know, we could have picked the wrong, you know, we could have extended about five feet or shifted the whole square that we'd picked, you know, five feet one way or the other. We might have found something. We just, we just don't know. The area is uh, very large, uh, very wooded. and but we felt we did have to go down there at least try and we did but we came up empty-handed well i'll make sure to put a link to the fbi website article about this case and so they can check out that photo because you know it's pretty interesting i'll also link uh put a link to the book uh that you mentioned about Sharon's life in case anybody wants to uh okay. check that out too so of course the big question is who was Michael's father? 
if it wasn't Floyd? So Michael's father is, he lives out, last I heard he lived in Oregon. And going back some time here in this convoluted story, I believe he had met Sharon, then Sharon, in the Phoenix area. And they had gotten pregnant and had this kid. But, you know, at one point Floyd had also called, reached out to him and asked if he was willing to take Michael and raise him, which he was. But ultimately, Floyd never called him back again. And here we are today with, with Michael being dead. But so Sharon had two other children also. She got pregnant in her senior year of high school, which kind of, which really dashed her, her hopes of going to college. And that, that baby, we think, was adopted out. No one really knows. There's no records that we found, nor would we. But the, the second child she had was adopted, and I've actually met her. She was adopted out by a family in the New Orleans. I think the New Orleans. It's in Louisiana. I think it's New Orleans. And you know, after all this was over, the you know, all credit to the author of the book. He spearheaded. You know, Tanya Hughes, when she was killed, was buried in, in Broken Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, which is a suburb of Tulsa. And to his credit, he spearheaded a raising money to to change out the birthstone or to head the headstone to read Suzanne Savakis. And you know, been about two years ago now that that ceremony happened. Uh, the author was there. I went out there with with the uh, Melissa Shaver, the squad operations specialist. My wife went with us, and they had a police chaplain do a nice you know a nice ceremony. Uh, Joe Fitzpatrick showed up. The prosecutors, the federal prosecutors who worked the kidnapping case in, in federal court, were there, and uh, even the father, Clifford Savakis, showed up. Mom didn't, but the Clifford Savakis flew down and, and, and attended as well. It was kind of a, a fitting end to that story. Wow! And I guess you know, for me, just thinking about the case, it's just something that you know, in our normal lives, with our happy families and loving families, and you know, we don't think about all of the children who are growing up in, you know, situations like this. And I'm telling you, it's, 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 it's really gotten to me. And I, I can tell, you know, from the way you're talking, that it is something that continues to, to also touch your heart. You know, it does. I, I've always told people, I said, I loved and it. And they kind of look at you funny. Now, people who work this violation, crimes against children, understand what I'm saying. I loved working crimes against children. I really did because children can't fight back and they need somebody to fight for them. But at the end of the day, there is, you know, there is a lot of, unfortunately, there's a lot of that abuse, that child abuse, whether it be physical or sexual or emotional, that happens in this country. I don't know what the answer is, Jerry. You know, I just, I did my, I did what I could when I was working that violation. As every crime against children coordinator or agent does in the bureau. It's, it's a, it's a passion, you know, fighting for those kids, something, something I'll always do, even, even in retirement, you know, something I will always do. Beautiful. Is there anything else we didn't cover on this case that you'd like to share with us? You know, I would thank everybody who, who assisted on this case. And in this case really goes back to, you know, the work Joe Fitzpatrick did uh, the work that his co-case agents did, the prosecutors, all the help that I had from Nate and from from Melissa. It's Team FBI. As you well know, a successful case is not one one agent. It's it's a it's a whole cadre of of agents and support staff that that bring cases to a successful conclusion. I'm I'm just thankful for the people I've I've had the opportunity to work with throughout my career who always had that that passion to do to to help and to you know fight for victims and fight for justice. So let's talk a little bit about why you, you know, wanted to work in law enforcement. So let's go back to the beginning and I'm going to ask you when you joined the FBI and, and why you joined the FBI. Sure. You know, I graduated college. I was working, uh, working for a chain of restaurants in, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, a, a Tex-Mex chain. And I enjoyed it. I really did. And, but my father-in-law, he talked to me about his job in the Border Patrol and he encouraged me to apply and it sounded interesting to me and I did. And I, and I applied and got hired and then spent uh, three years in the El Paso area as a border patrol agent, I transferred to Omaha, Nebraska as a deportation officer, which sounds just like 
just like what it sounds like. I, I flew people all over the world, taking them back home who'd been ordered deported and doing fugitive work on fugitive aliens. And then I slid over to the investigation side of the house when it was then the Immigration and Naturalization Service. I ended up making a case against a a Palestinian who had been served time in Israeli prison for firebombing Jewish holy sites back in the early 90s. And, you know, he he lied on his visa application. We figured out who he really was. And and my supervisor said, well, you must be good at that. You know, basically, you must be good at that terrorism thing. So he put me on the JTTF at the Omaha office of the FBI and did that. Was there for about six months and just great guys, just, you know, salt of the earth guys. And they, they encouraged me to apply to the FBI and, and they had, they talked, you know, I'd add a lot of questions for them and, and what violations they work. And, you know, at that time, INS, now ICE, it's a one trick pony. It's immigration. Back then it was, you know, I had nine years in doing that and I was ready for something new. And I liked the quality of the individual I saw at the FBI there in Omaha. And I applied. And January of 2004, I started the FBI Academy. I think I was 35 at the time. First office agent in Little Rock. Back then, we had the three-year transfer policy that the director Mueller had uh, instituted. So after three years, I was transferred to the Phoenix field office and put in the Tucson RA and uh, did some JTTF work there for about a uh, year or two. And then I slid over to working uh, drugs on the criminal side. And I did an officer preference transfer to uh, Oklahoma City in 2012. And shortly after I got here, I was working drugs. And then shortly after the uh, Crimes Against Children coordinator spot opened up and uh, I jumped at it. Well, I have to tell you that when you talked about the case that you worked against the missionary in Kenya who was, Mm -hmm. you know, raping and molesting kids, Mm -hmm. you know, that sounds like a horrific case. But one, yeah, but one that... I think would be fascinating to hear about because of the international aspect of it. I take it the missionary was an American citizen. Yep, he was. You know? Yeah, so if if you're interested, you know, maybe sometime later in the year, we could talk about that case, the investigative methods involved in investigating a case like that, that is taking place overseas mm-hmm. and the relationship that you would have with the law enforcement you know, in, in Kenya to, to, to work that case. That would be fascinating if you're interested. I'd, I'd love to, Jerry. I'd love to sit down and tell you about it. It takes a special, special, special person to be able to fight for kids in the way that you did. And I can tell you how much I appreciate the work that you and other agents and law enforcement around the world do to safeguard children and, and bring justice for children. Thank you, Jerry. I appreciate that. These are heavy investigations, but I I really do think that we need to talk about them. With all of that that you did in your career, what are you doing now? So I finished up my career at the FBI. I was the aviation coordinator. Oh, uh, you know what? I forgot about that. That was something else I want to talk about. When we do the case review for the Kenya case, then uh, it'd be great to also talk about what it is like to be an FBI agent pilot because that's something that uh, I've only touched on a few times. So we'll, we'll save sure. the details of that <laughs> okay. for, for next time. But uh, you were able to, to take that, those skills um, and experience and, and use that after the Bureau? I, I, yes. I work for a, a company out of Guthrie, Oklahoma, which is just north of where I live, uh, called Guardian Aerial Patrol. And I do a low-level pipeline patrol and fly throughout Oklahoma and Texas inspecting pipelines, rights away, pipeline rights away, looking for leaks, construction going on that's not known, down markers, things of that nature. And I've been doing this coming up on a year now since, well, June will be a year since I retired. So that's what I do. I fly a plane. I get paid to fly a plane. We're at the end and I'd like to give my guests the last word. What would you like to say? Well, first of all, thank you for the opportunity. I was turned on to this podcast from a, a, our dear friends across the street. They have a daughter, her youngest daughter. She's, you know, she's grown in, in her early 20s. She likes true crime. She, she asked me about this case, and she's the one who kind of turned me on to this, you know, the podcast. There's so much good that goes on in the FBI on a daily basis, and you know this, I know this, and every agent knows this. It's, it's just nice that you are giving agents the opportunity to showcase what the FBI does and paint them in a positive light. I am thankful for the people that I've worked with throughout my career. Couldn't have, I could not have had the success in any of my investigations without the incredible 
agents smarter than I am and the incredible support staff who, who assisted on those investigations. When you look back, it really is Team FBI. And that is a good thing that I'm glad you, you have this platform so the public can know this. Hey, it was a great career. You know, I, I spent 24 and a half years in federal law enforcement, the last 15 of it with the FBI. And I have no regrets looking back, no regrets whatsoever. Worked with some of the greatest people in the FBI I have ever known. Had to come to an end, and it did, but they will never be forgotten. And I still get to see a lot of them quite often. So, And that's the end of the interview. At jerrywilliams.com, you'll find a photo of Scott Lobb. You'll find news articles about the investigation of the kidnapping of Michael Hughes and how Scott Lobb and his FBI colleagues were able to identify Suzanne Savakis, a.k.a. Sharon Marshall and Tanya Hughes. There's also photos of Suzanne and a wanted flyer for Franklin Floyd, as well as a photo of that ERT search for the remains of six-year-old Michael. There's also links to the two books by Matt Birkback, Beautiful Child, and Finding Sharon. I hope you enjoyed the episode and that you'll share it with your friends, family, and associates. If they're not sure how to listen to a podcast, have them read the post on my website, How to Listen to a Podcast. And don't forget to subscribe to FBI Retired Case File Review on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. I would also love it if you checked out the link for my books and your podcast app's description of this episode. My nonfiction books, FBI Myths and Misconceptions, a manual for armchair detectives, which goes through 20 cliches and misconceptions about the FBI and books, TV, and movies. And then there's the companion book, FBI Word Search Puzzles, fun for armchair detectives. My FBI Philadelphia Corruption Squad crime series features flawed female FBI agent Carrie Wheeler in Pay to Play and Greedy Givers. All of my books are available wherever books are sold as ebooks, print books, and audiobooks. If you've already picked up copies of my books, please consider leaving a review. Reviews help readers find good books. Thank you for listening to the very end, and I hope you come back again for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.